Stadium disasters are something I've only touched on on this channel, but the moment I did, one event was immediately requested. Something that involves one of my favorite topics to bring up, human error. This isn't the first or the last event that went down this way and ended the lives of many. Tragic to hear about, but always fascinating to discuss for me. Fans should never worry about dying when they go to see their favorite football game. But here we are again. Let's talk about what happened at the Hillsborough Stadium. Hillsborough Stadium opened in Owlerton, England in 1899. With a capacity of 39,732 at the time, it contains two two-tier stands and two single-tier stands, all covered. It was selected as a neutral venue for the 1989 semifinals between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest. It was April 15th, and this is where our disaster will take place. The game was a big deal, to say the least attracting roughly 54,000 fans to the stadium that certainly couldn't hold them all. Much like my video about Hazel Stadium, the entrance of fans was separated to avoid hooliganism and fights. Liverpool fans with tickets were directed through seven turnstiles from Leapings Lane, two of which led into fenced-off pens. The day of the match, TV stations and radio ads told fans without tickets not to attend, trying to prevent an overcrowding situation, so of course, no one listened. A bottleneck formed on Leppings Lane, with roughly 10,000 fans trying to enter at 2.30pm, 30 minutes before kickoff, and half of them were still stuck outside. Even fans turned away from having no ticket, or the wrong turnstile ticket, couldn't get out of the advancing crowd. At 2.52, Police Chief David Duckenfield, who had little experience with stadium crowd control, authorized opening Exit Gate C in order to relieve congestion. The problem here was a serious lack of balance letting the fans in, because there were pens on the sides that were mostly empty, but this bottleneck of fans had nowhere to go and no direction. A 20-minute delay of the game was denied, and with the kickoff counting down, fans were getting more anxious to get inside. About 2,000 fans pushed and shoved their way into the narrow tunnels that led to the already crowded center pens 3 and 4. With little to no room to move due to the tall steel fencing that separated fans from the field. As the game started at 3 p.m., goalkeeper Bruce Grobelar recalled fans in the pens behind him, calling out, pleading for help as they were being pressed into the fence. Pressure was starting to press the fans up against the crush fence, and police, at first, were trying to prevent them from spilling out of the pen, thinking it was a pitch invasion. It went fast. By just 3.05, police superintendent Greenwood realized what was going on and grabbed the referee to stop the game. By now, the barrier in Pen 3 was starting to give way, and fans were climbing it in desperate attempts to escape the crush. Due to a huge lack of communication and coordination, police never activated the major incident procedure. Fans were left helpless from rescue in many cases, having to rely on themselves and each other to get help. Fans broke open a small gate and tore holes in the fence to relieve pressure. The ones who escaped were frantically attempting to pull those still trapped behind the barrier free. With enough force, the barrier came down, and fans spilled out onto the terrace where others had escaped. Players from the teams were ushered back to their respective dressing rooms and told that it would just be a short 30-minute delay, which shows just how poorly the severity of the situation was communicated. Ambulance workers arrived on the field, where they were quickly overwhelmed by injured fans. Uninjured fans jumped to help, attempting CPR and using advertising boards as stretchers for the injured. Further confusion and general bad decision-making continued when EMTs were told they were supposed to stay outside the stadium and wait for the injured to be brought out to them. With this absurd set of protocols, ambulances sat outside like a useless parking lot while the injured remained inside in desperate need of help. In total, 42 ambulances arrived on the scene, but only two made it inside because they broke protocol. 
The combined ambulances took 149 people to the hospital. 760 were injured, and unfortunately, 96 people lost their lives that day due mostly to asphyxiation. This disaster was tragic, but it unfortunately doesn't end there. Much like other stadium disasters, the police were quick to place blame on the fans. They stated that the Liverpool crowd was rowdy and drunk, and that they had forced open exit gate C to let themselves in. Superintendent John Nesbitt of the Yorkshire Police later stated that letting fans rescue each other was deliberate, claiming that this would divert their anger from the police. In 2009, the tragedy was further investigated by an independent firm, and three years later, they ruled that the police had certainly engaged in a far-reaching cover-up. Blaming fans and falsifying reports to make themselves look better, this investigation started turning heads towards the police, and in 2014, Chief Duckenfield admitted that he had lied about fans being the ones who opened Exit Gate C. In the following year, criminal charges were filed against six individuals directly connected to the disaster, and Duckenfield faced 95 charges of manslaughter. This tragedy is a perfect example of miscommunication, misdirection, and the police looking out for themselves. Blaming the victims for this kind of disaster is tasteless and immoral, and the more we investigate these kind of things, the more the truth can come to the surface. Thanks for watching. For more true crime and horror, please consider subscribing. Game with me on Twitch, follow me on Twitter, and as always, be well. Special thanks to Dr. Varen Pant for your generous Patreon donation. Appreciate your support.